The state of Iowa is known as the corn capital of the world. But Iowa's 3 million residents do a lot more than produce billions of bushels of corn every year. They also personify some of the best qualities that America has to offer. Located in the Midwestern part of the country and surrounded by two rivers and six other states, the people of Iowa take pride in being friendly, considerate, law-abiding, hardworking, and just plain nice. The state is one of the safest in the country, and every year, national surveys show that Iowa residents are among the most polite Americans you will ever meet. And if there's one place in Iowa where you are guaranteed to be treated, quote, Iowa nice, it's the little town in the southwest corner of the state called Shenandoah. At one time, Shenandoah was considered the seed and nursery capital of the entire world. They no longer hold that title, but residents of this town are still surrounded by some of the most beautiful flowers and trees on the planet, along with some of the best tasting fruits and vegetables. And back in 1988, if there was one person in Shenandoah who absolutely embodied the town's spirit of friendliness, hospitality, and local pride, it was 39-year-old Cindy Borton. If you were a visitor to Shenandoah back in the late 1980s, Cindy would be one of the first people to run right up to you to introduce herself and offer you directions or recommendations of where to go in her little town. And if you were one of Cindy's friends or neighbors, she would drop anything she was doing to help you, and it didn't matter if it was day or night. Unlike many of the town's 5,500 residents whose family had been living in the town for generations, Cindy and her husband Robert and their son John had moved to Shenandoah later in life. Cindy was born on May 22, 1949, in another small Iowa town called Garwin that was located three and a half hours to the northeast of Shenandoah. There, she and her brother had grown up playing outside and helping their parents with daily chores. After high school, Cindy went to work at a local restaurant, which is where she met her future husband, Robert. He had grown up in another Iowa town about 30 minutes away from her. Robert was a stocky young man with horn-rimmed glasses and brown hair that he swept back from his receding hairline, and when he met Cindy, he was instantly charmed by the smiling and laughing waitress with thick dark hair and shining eyes. A year after meeting, Cindy and Robert got married, and one year after that, they welcomed their first and only child, a baby boy named John. Early on in their marriage, Robert enlisted in the U.S. Navy, and so he was gone a lot of the time. As a result, Cindy stepped up and became the anchor of the family, always putting the needs of her husband and her son over her own. She also began working multiple part-time jobs to supplement Robert's military income, which was just not that much. However, she only took jobs that did not interfere with her ability to spend quality time with her son, John. In 1977, after Robert left the military, the Bortons moved to a town in Illinois called Evanston. There, Robert enrolled in a private seminary so that he could fulfill his lifelong dream of becoming an ordained pastor. In 1981, Robert graduated from the seminary, and a year later, he got an offer from a little church in Shenandoah asking him to come be their pastor. Robert and Cindy were thrilled, and so after Robert accepted the offer, the little family packed up their belongings and then made the eight-hour trip west back to their home state of Iowa and into the pretty little town of Shenandoah. Once in Shenandoah, Cindy immediately threw herself into her new role as the pastor's wife. She was naturally outgoing and empathetic, and so she pretty much instantly became a favorite, not just with Robert's congregation, but with the rest of the town as well. Even though Robert had landed his dream job, it was not a high-paying job, and so like Cindy, he needed to go out and pick up some extra work to make ends meet. Robert would get a part-time job at a car dealership where he washed and cleaned cars, and Cindy, after arriving in Shenandoah, worked as many as three part-time jobs, including her main one at a donut shop. But despite how much Cindy and Robert were forced to work every week, they were very happy people. In fact, when most people described Cindy when she was living in Shenandoah, they would talk about her laughter, because one, she seemed to always be laughing and smiling, and two, because her laughter was incredibly infectious and anyone who heard it couldn't help but laugh themselves. But the Bortons' seemingly perfect life would go off the rails in 1987, five years after the Bortons had arrived in Shenandoah. 
That summer, Robert's church, which had been struggling financially for years, was finally forced to shut their doors, and so Robert's job was gone, and so too was his main source of income. This loss was devastating both emotionally and financially for the Borton family. By September of the following year, 1988, Robert had not had any luck finding another pastor gig in town or nearby, and the income they were making between Robert's car dealership work and Cindy's various part-time jobs was just not enough, and so the couple began talking about relocating. However, they both loved Shenandoah, it was their home, and John, who was 18 at the time, he was about to start his senior year in high school, and so they really didn't want to pull him out until he was done. And so Cindy and Robert decided that they would just stay in Shenandoah and they would weather the financial storm they were in, and then maybe after John graduated from high school, they would think about moving. But when John's senior year actually began that September, the Borton's 18-year-old son suddenly developed a serious case of senioritis, meaning he didn't want to go to school. And on the morning of Tuesday, September 6th, just a few days into the new school year, John walked into the family kitchen and announced to his mother that he did not want to go to school ever. Cindy had to argue with John all by herself because Robert had already left that morning for work. But luckily, John eventually just gave up because he knew his mother was not going to budge. She wanted him to go to school. And so begrudgingly, John ate his breakfast, he gathered up his backpack, and he followed his mother out to her car that was parked in the driveway. On the drive to school, Cindy reminded her son that she'd be working at the donut shop that afternoon, and so he'd have to walk home. When they arrived at Shenandoah High School a few minutes later, John, who was still very annoyed with his mother for forcing him to go to school that day, he got out and he slammed the car door before mumbling a barely audible goodbye to his mother. As Cindy drove the short distance back to their house, she tried to tell herself that, you know, John's behavior was just typical teenage behavior, and once the school year really got going, John's attitude would surely improve. Still, it was something she intended to talk to Robert about when he came home that afternoon for his lunch break. Once Cindy was back at their home, she parked the car in the driveway and walked through the back door and down the short hallway into the kitchen. After cleaning up the breakfast dishes, she caught up on a few household chores and made sure that the clothes she planned to wear to work that afternoon were clean and ready to go. Then she glanced at her watch and headed back into the kitchen to heat up some spaghetti sauce and pasta for lunch with Robert. Right at 12 p.m. that afternoon, just a half mile away, Robert would tell his boss that he was headed home for his one-hour-long lunch break. A few minutes later, Robert pulled his pickup truck into the driveway of his modest little house, he turned off the engine, and he walked up the steps to the front door. As he stepped into their small living room, he called out to let Cindy know that he was home. After she called back to him from the kitchen, Robert went to the first floor bathroom to wash up before he too headed into the kitchen to join his wife. As Cindy served him a hot plate of spaghetti, Robert listened as Cindy told him about how John had not wanted to go to school that morning and how upset he was when she dropped him off. And Robert would agree with his wife that, you know, this did seem like typical teenage behavior and that, yeah, probably as the school year wore on, his attitude would change. The pair would chat about John's behavior for the bulk of their meal. And then at about 1245, Robert put his dishes in the sink. He thanked Cindy for his lunch. And then he told her he'd see her that afternoon after she got home from her shift at the donut shop. A few minutes after Robert had left the house to return to work, Cindy was already washing the lunch dishes when she heard a knock on the back door. She glanced at her watch and wondered who would be visiting her in the middle of the day. A little over an hour later, at around 2 p.m., Robert received a call at the car dealership where he worked. When his boss handed him the phone, Robert heard the voice of Cindy's co-worker at the donut shop. Sue Rogers told him that Cindy had not shown up for work, which was unlike her since she usually arrived for her shift early. Sue had tried calling the Borton house, but no one had picked up. Robert told Sue that, you know, maybe Cindy had taken a nap after lunch and she's just overslept. An hour later, at 3 p.m., Robert got another call from the donut shop. This time, Sue sounded worried. Cindy still had not shown up for work, and a co-worker who went by the Borton house had stopped at the back door to call out for Cindy, but didn't get an answer and they noticed that the door was open. But this coworker didn't want to go inside without being invited, and so they left. Robert called home, and when Cindy did not pick up the phone, he asked his boss if he could leave work to go check on his wife. 
Just after 3.30 p.m., Robert pulled up to his house, and the first thing he noticed was that Cindy's car was still in the driveway. After parking his truck just behind her car, Robert walked up to the front door and let himself in, calling out his wife's name as soon as he stepped inside. When there was no answer, Robert began walking from the living room where he came in at the front of the house toward the back of the house where the kitchen was. As he walked, he kept yelling out for Cindy, but it was silent. When Robert finally reached the kitchen and got a view of the kitchen, he came to a complete and sudden stop. Backing slowly away, Robert reached for a nearby phone on the wall and he called 911. When they picked up, he would tell police to come to his house right away because his wife had had a terrible accident. After hanging up the phone, Robert grabbed the family dog's collar off of a nearby hook and he put it on the dog and led the dog outside to the backyard where he tied the dog up and then Robert walked around the outside of the house to the driveway in front where he leaned against the side of Cindy's car and there he waited patiently for the police to arrive. When the local police and ambulance arrived at the Borton house a few minutes later, Robert stepped forward to meet them. Then he stayed outside while the police and the medical technicians entered the front door and made their way into the kitchen and back. What they saw inside was so shocking and so gruesome that the chief of police, Richard Hunt, he knew this was not a crime or a crime scene that his local police force could handle. He needed serious help from the state and he needed that help right away. The kitchen was covered in blood, and lying on her back in the middle of the floor was Cindy Borton. She had been stabbed 29 times with various bloody weapons that were found near her body on the ground. Based on the sheer violence of the attack and the fact that the back door had been unlocked and undamaged, Chief Hunt was sure that this crime had been personal. He knew the crime statistics in Iowa, 85% of all homicides in the state were committed by people and family members who were close to the victim, which meant that right away, Cindy's husband, Robert, and her son, John, were at the top of the list of potential suspects. And so as Chief Hunt and the rest of the local police force more or less waited for the state law enforcement to arrive so they could actually begin processing the scene, Chief Hunt decided to just go outside and speak with Robert. And so he went outside, he walked down the front steps, and he made his way over to Robert, who was still near Cindy's car. And Chief Hunt would ask him, Robert, do you have any idea who could have done this to your wife? After Robert said, no, he didn't, the police chief was shocked when Cindy's husband went on to insist that his wife's death must have been an accident. But before the chief could continue questioning Robert, they were interrupted by the arrival of the Borton family's son, John, who was walking down the road towards the family house on his way home from school. John slowed down as he approached the house and took in the sight of the police cars and an ambulance parked along the curb and the yellow crime scene tape along the perimeter of their yard. When John reached his father, Robert told him that something bad had happened to his mother and that she was dead. But as Robert reached out to put his hands on his son's shoulders, John dropped his backpack and just turned around and started running. Later, he would tell law enforcement that the news was so shocking he just couldn't handle it, and so that's why he ran. When John did return to his house almost two hours later, personnel from the state's Division of Criminal Investigation had finally arrived, and they were dusting for fingerprints and gathering evidence inside of the Borden house and local law enforcement had fanned out around the neighborhood to ask the Borton's neighbors if they had seen anything unusual or suspicious that day. By then, Robert had also told police exactly what he had done that day, starting with him leaving the house at 6.45 a.m. to go to work, and then arriving at work at 7 a.m., and then coming home again at noon for lunch with Cindy, and then leaving again and getting back to the car dealership at 1 p.m. Robert also described the calls he got from the donut shop saying that Cindy had not shown up for her 2 p.m. shift, and he would describe to police what it was like when he arrived at his house at 3.30 p.m. to check to see if Cindy was okay. After John was back at the house, he would tell police that he had been at school from the time his mother had dropped him off in the morning until school let out at 3.30 and then he had walked home. When the state investigators asked John if anything about that morning had seemed out of the ordinary, at first, John said no, but then after a few seconds, he changed his answer to yes. He said that he and his mother had been arguing that morning because John didn't want to go to school that day, but he told police this was not anything serious. 
By the time John and Robert left the Borton property to go stay that night with friends that they knew from Robert's old church, word had spread throughout Shenandoah that something unspeakable had happened to one of the town's most popular residents. Early the next morning on September 7th, there were police officers waiting at Robert's car dealership to check on Robert's alibi. And while Robert's timesheet confirmed the timeline Robert had given them, Robert's boss added one detail about that day that Robert had left out. When Robert arrived back at the dealership after his lunch break, he had apparently changed his clothes. When asked if that was unusual, his boss would say, not really. Robert's boss would say that on Tuesdays, the car dealership's commercial cleaning service would come by to pick up dirty uniforms and rags. And so Robert's boss thought that, you know, maybe Robert had come to work that day in his work clothes. He had gotten a full morning of work in. And then when he went home for lunch, he had changed. And then when he had come back, maybe he had dropped off those dirty clothes from the morning with the cleaning service. While this seemed totally plausible, investigators couldn't help but think that if Robert was involved in the murder of his wife, and if there was any evidence from the murder on those work clothes, well, that evidence was now being destroyed by a commercial washing machine. Meanwhile, investigators who had arrived at Shenandoah High School early that morning to check John's alibi also had some questions. It would turn out John's alibi was not as straightforward as he had made it seem. His teachers at his high school told police that yes, John had come to school the previous day, but he did not have any classes between 1 and 3 p.m., and no one could really verify his whereabouts at that time, and it just so happens that that was likely the time frame when his mother was killed. And later that afternoon, a neighbor would tell police that they had seen a teenager running through the Borton's backyard around the time that Cindy would have been killed. The neighbor couldn't give police much of a description of this teenager, except to say that the teenager was a boy, and that he had a thin build, and it looked like his hair was brown, which was basically a perfect description of John. And so, two days after Cindy's death, detectives brought John into the police station for questioning. When pressed about the 1 to 3 p.m. gap in his alibi, John would adamantly state that he never left school grounds during that time period. He said he had been at school all day from the time his mother dropped him off until he walked home and discovered the police and ambulances in front of his house. When asked about his parents' relationship, John admitted that there was some tension there and that sometimes he heard his parents arguing mostly about money. But John also told police that his mother and father were very committed to each other and had been quite happy in the past. And so no matter what problems they might be having, John was confident that his parents were not even close to getting divorced. He believed they would look to find a solution that kept them together. As for his own relationship with his mother, John told police that his mother had been everything to him and that it totally crushed him that his last interaction with her was that stupid fight about him not wanting to go to school. Despite Robert and John continuing to deny that they had anything to do with the murder, 48 hours into the investigation, the father and son were still the prime suspects. Three days after Cindy's murder, on September 9th, the results of her autopsy came back. Based on the fact that the spaghetti she had eaten for lunch on the day of her murder was completely undigested, police were able to narrow the time of her death down to about 1 p.m. Meanwhile, investigators questioning teachers and students at Shenandoah High School were starting to believe that John had been telling the truth, that he really had been on school grounds on the day of the murder from 1 to 3 p.m. At Cindy's memorial service on September 13th, six days after her murder, investigators were waiting outside the church. Before scratching John off of their suspect list, they wanted to talk with John's best friend, Jim Bettis, to see if he could offer any additional insights into John's relationship with his mother. Jim had been a frequent visitor at the Borton household, and since Cindy's death, he had been spending a lot of time with John, comforting him. And so police were hopeful that if John was involved, you know, maybe Jim would have picked up on it, and maybe Jim would be willing to talk about it. 
But according to Jim, there really were no problems between John and his mother. He said John loved his mother and that he would never hurt her. And as for that fight that they got in over John going to school or not that morning, Jim said that was totally insignificant and not a reflection of John and Cindy's actual relationship. After speaking with Jim and a few other friends of John's that came out of the memorial service, investigators felt satisfied that John really was not involved, and so they crossed his name off the suspect list. So with no other new leads, and no further information on any teenager running across the Borton's yard on the afternoon of the murder, investigators were now sure that the killer had to be Cindy's husband, Robert. So, about one week after the murder, investigators brought Robert into the interrogation room in the basement of the local police station, and then once he was sitting down, a special agent from the state's Division of Criminal Investigation leaned in close to Robert and said, Bob, let's quit playing games. We both know Cindy was dead when you went back to work. But for the next three hours, Robert, who showed very little emotion and no signs of grief, refused to change his story. He said he had nothing to do with his wife's murder. He said that Cindy had seemed totally normal when he left for work early on the morning of the day she died, and when he came home for lunch that day at noon, she was alive. And she was also still alive when he left to go back to work at 12.45 p.m. Before leaving the police station, Robert agreed to have his fingerprints collected, and he agreed to take a lie detector test. So, the very next day, a special agent drove Robert 150 miles northeast to Des Moines, where Robert was hooked up to a polygraph machine that would measure his physical reactions to a series of key questions. Questions like, did you hurt your wife? Or, did you kill your wife? And Robert would answer these questions the same way he had the day before in the basement interrogation room at the police station. No, I didn't hurt my wife. No, I didn't kill my wife. But this time, the polygraph machine showed that Robert was not being truthful. He didn't fail his test by much, but the results convinced investigators that despite Robert's denials, he must be the killer. And so the agent who had administered the lie detector test pulled Robert aside for another round of intense questioning, telling him, hey, you failed this test, so you got to tell us the truth now. But Robert continued to say that he had nothing to do with it, and he even fell asleep during this interrogation. Even with this failed lie detector test, the police lacked hard evidence that linked Robert to the murder. And so even though they wanted to keep him, they couldn't. They had to let him go. And so a special agent drove Robert back to Shenandoah, and on the drive, he turned to Robert and he said, You know, Bob, when this is all over and you've been arrested, charged, tried, and convicted, I would be honored if you confessed to me. But a week later, two and a half weeks after Cindy's murder, investigators got another piece of bad news when the state's crime lab reported that they had not been able to lift any fingerprints from the various murder weapons that had been found in Cindy's kitchen. They also were unable to pull any prints off of any other physical evidence that had been sent off for testing. As September inched towards October, and police had still not made any arrests, the residents of Shenandoah were outraged and scared. Every day, they called the police station and the mayor's office seeking updates, and local gun stores reported a serious uptick in sales. And in November, Robert, who was being questioned by police nearly every day, and was being shunned by residents who now walked across the street to avoid talking with him, he packed up the family's belongings and moved with John to the town of Gladbrook, just outside of Des Moines, where he and Cindy had actually gotten married. Around this time, local reporters began asking the question that was on everyone's mind. How was it possible that in a town as small as Shenandoah, police could not figure out who had committed such a heinous crime? And on top of having a murderer on the loose, Shenandoah also had an arsonist on the loose. Around the time Cindy was killed, someone had been intentionally setting fires around town, damaging an elementary school, as well as destroying a pickup truck. And while the arson attacks didn't appear to be connected to Cindy's murder, it did seem odd that there would be two violent crimes happening at the same time in a town that saw almost zero violent crime. And so some investigators began to suspect, just because of the rarity of violent crime, that the arson attacks and the murder had to be connected. 
and on November 30th of that year, their suspicions seemed to be confirmed. On that day, there was an arson attack at Shenandoah City Hall, except this time, the arsonist left behind a note. On this note, the arsonist warned police that the school fire and the truck fire and the murder of Cindy Borton were nothing compared to what was coming next. At the end of this note, the arsonist identified themselves as, quote, the Night Stalker. The Night Stalker was the name of a notorious murderer in California who had been captured three years earlier. But what really caught the attention of law enforcement was the fact that whoever had signed the note also left behind a fingerprint at the very bottom of the piece of paper the note was written on. While investigators waited on the results of the fingerprint analysis, they returned to the scenes of the earlier arson attacks, and on a bridge near the school fire, police had found the letters NS painted on a concrete support. They believed these had to be the initials of the Night Stalker. By early December, the mayor of Shenandoah had received more than 200 calls from terrified residents demanding that the police find the arsonist slash killer before they murdered anyone else. But the Night Stalker lead came to an abrupt end a few weeks later when the fingerprint analysis not only failed to match Richard Borton's fingerprints, it didn't match any prints on file in any local, state, or federal law enforcement database. So unfortunately, both the arson cases and the murder case began to grow cold. It wasn't until five months after Cindy Borton's murder that local and state investigators would get the tip they needed to break the murder and arson cases wide open. Around dinner time on the cloudy, cool night of January 30th, 1989, the Shenandoah police chief, Richard Hunt, got a call from one of his officers. There was a teenager who had just walked into the police station, and he wanted to talk with someone about the murder of Cindy Borton. A few minutes later, Chief Hunt was sitting in his office looking across his desk at 18-year-old Jack Johnson, one of John Borton's best friends and classmates, and one of the boys investigators had talked with back in September when they were confirming John's alibi for the time of his mother's murder. Jack told Chief Hunt that a few days earlier, on January 26th, Jack had been talking to someone, and during their conversation, Jack had asked this person what was the worst thing they had ever done. And this person paused for a moment, and then they said to Jack, I've done something that I'm pretty sure God will never forgive me for. Jack would go on to tell police all the awful details of what this person claimed to have done that God would not forgive them for. Based on Jack's testimony, this is a reconstruction of what really happened to Cindy Borden. Back on the day that Cindy died, September 6th, 1988, she and her husband Robert were sitting in the kitchen eating spaghetti and talking about their son's recent bad behavior. After Robert was done eating, he put his dirty dishes in the sink, he thanked his wife for the food, and then he headed out the door to go back to work. As Cindy began washing the dishes, she heard a knock on the back door. Glancing at her watch, she saw it was already almost 1 p.m., which meant she didn't really have a lot of time to visit with whoever this was before she had to step away and get ready for her 2 p.m. shift at the donut shop. And so feeling a little bit flustered, Cindy turned off the faucet and she dried her hands, and then she walked around the counter and she walked down the very short hallway that led to the back door of the house. And as she walked down this hallway, she looked through the glass of the back door and she saw who her visitor was. And even though she was pressed for time, she couldn't help herself. She smiled. She was happy to see him. However, she was a little bit concerned that her visitor was not in school. But she opened the door and as soon as the door was open, her visitor immediately reassured her that he understood he was supposed to be in school and he'd be there soon. He was just stopping by because he was hoping that Cindy wouldn't mind being a reference for a job that he was going to be applying for. And so Cindy said, yeah, of course I'll be a reference for your new job. I'd love to hear about your new job. Come inside. Let's talk about it. And so her visitor stepped inside, and as they walked down the little hallway towards the kitchen, the visitor asked Cindy if it was okay if she got him a glass of water because he was really thirsty. And so Cindy said, yeah, no problem. Come in the kitchen. I'll get you water, and we can talk about this new job. And so they start walking down this hallway, and the visitor reaches into his pocket, and he unfolds his pocket knife. And right as Cindy is stepping into the kitchen with her back to him, he walks up behind her, he reaches around the front of her neck, and he digs the blade into the front of her throat, cutting her neck wide open. 
Cindy instinctively reached up and tried to grab her neck to protect herself, but her attacker grabbed her hands, pulled them away, and then with the knife, he dug another trench across her throat. And then the attacker backed up a couple of steps. Cindy, who was now pouring blood out of her neck, stumbled forward into the kitchen, and then she whipped around, clutching her throat, looking at her attacker. It was 18-year-old Jim Bettis, her son's best friend. But she didn't have time to process who was attacking her, because before long, as she was staring at him, he lunged at her again, slashing and cutting her. And so she put her hands up over her face to protect herself, and he was digging the knife over and over again into her forearms and her hands and all over her body. And eventually she kind of slumped onto the kitchen counter after being stabbed and cut so many times, at which point Jim walked away from her and he walked over to a drawer that he knew from all of the visits he had made to this household to visit with John. He knew that in this drawer, drawer were kitchen knives and other utensils. And so as Cindy is laying right near him up against the counter, pleading with him to stop and she's bleeding everywhere, he reaches into this drawer and he pulls out two of Cindy's sharpest knives and he sets them on the counter and then he pulls out two long serving forks that each had very pointed prongs at the end. And so he turns around to look at Cindy and Cindy sees what he's doing and so she tries to make a run for the phone to call 911. But before she could get there, Jim grabbed the two knives that he had just taken out of the drawer and he leapt in front of Cindy and began stabbing her over and over and over again on her sides, her front, her face, her hands, her legs, anywhere he could, he would stab her. And Cindy the whole time is trying to hit him and push him back, but there's nothing she can do. She's helpless. And then at some point she kind of falls to the ground, but she's not dead yet. And so at that point, Jim put down the two knives he had just taken out of that drawer and he went back and he got the two serving forks. And then he went back over to Cindy, who was now crawling across the ground, trying to get to the phone. And he began stabbing her in the back, in the back of the neck, on the side, over and over and over again. Despite multiple puncture wounds to her vital organs, Cindy was not dying. She was bleeding profusely. She was likely mortally wounded at this point, but she kept trying to move forward. She kept trying to fight back. She was doing anything she could to save herself. But eventually, Jim overpowered her. He flipped her over onto her back. And then kneeling next to her, he got his tools lined up next to him, the two knives, his own knife, and the two serving forks. And systematically, he began using these tools to begin cutting and slashing and digging into the front of her torso. And he would continue to do that until Cindy finally stopped moving. And when she did stop moving, he picked up one of the serving forks, he raised it up over his head, and then he brought it straight down into her neck, plunging it deep inside of her. And then he let go of the handle, leaving the fork stuck into her neck. Then he wiped off the handle of that fork, as well as the other handles of the other murder weapons, which he just left on the floor next to Cindy, with the exception of his folding knife, he would take that. Then Jim stood up and walked into the small bathroom near the kitchen, and he washed his hands and face, leaving faint traces of blood in the sink, but wiping his fingerprints from the faucet handles. Then Jim retraced his steps to the back door. He stepped outside, and he paused for just a minute before taking off at a run across the Borton's yard. He would be seen by that neighbor, except the neighbor would only be able to describe him as a thin teenager with brown hair. Three hours later, Jim and his parents would be out driving around when they passed John, who had just bolted from the scene and the news of his mother's death. Jim's parents slowed the car down, and Jim leaned out the window, and he comforted his friend, asking him if he wanted to come into the car and talk about what happened, you know, did he need a ride anywhere? But John, who was in a state of shock, would just shake his head and keep on running. Five months after killing his best friend's mother, Jim would confess his crime to his other best friend, Jack Johnson. Not only would Jim tell Jack exactly where he had disposed of his pocket knife, he would also draw a diagram for Jack showing him exactly where Jim had left Cindy's body inside the Borton's kitchen. On the night of January 30th, which was the day that Jack Johnson had gone to police to tell them about Jim, he presented Jim's hand-drawn diagram and pushed it across the desk to Chief Hunt. On February 2nd, 1989, police asked Jim Bettis to come to the police station for an interview. 
Once inside the interrogation room, Jim denied everything, saying he had never had that conversation with Jack Johnson. But after agreeing to let police collect his fingerprints, police determined Jim's prints matched the one found on the note left by the Night Stalker. After another round of questioning, Jim eventually admitted to being the arsonist, but it wasn't until he conclusively and massively failed his polygraph test that he would admit to police that, yes, he had killed Cindy Borden. It would turn out Jim had nothing against Cindy. The person he really hated was his own father. According to Jim, his father had spent years deriding and criticizing him. For a while, Jim had taken out his anger by setting fires around town, but for the last several months, he'd come to despise his father so much that all Jim could think about was killing him. But Jim was afraid of his father and couldn't really imagine himself besting his father in any kind of physical confrontation. And Jim wasn't even sure he could go through with killing anyone. So he decided what he needed to do was practice. He needed to find someone who would be easy to kill, someone vulnerable, someone who trusted him, someone who loved him. And the one person who fit that bill was his best friend's mother, Cindy Borton. As far back as Jim could remember, Cindy had been the one person he knew who was always glad to see him and who always had time to talk with him and who always offered him encouragement. She would be the last person to suspect that he could ever hurt her. And so he told himself if he could kill Cindy, maybe he could also kill his father. The police were able to finally prove their case against Jim when they found his pocket knife that he had tossed under a local bridge. The knife still had Cindy's blood on it, along with Jim's fingerprints. On November 13th, 1989, Jim Bettis, who was 19 years old at the time, was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. In a letter Jim wrote from prison, he told a relative that when he, quote, killed that lady, I guess I went too far and pretended that she was my dad. By 1990, two years after Cindy's murder, Robert and John had moved again, this time to Eldora, Iowa, a town of 3,000 residents located about three and a half hours northeast of Shenandoah. Robert would remarry, and he would find work at a plastics recycling plant. State and local law enforcement in Shenandoah defended the intensive investigation techniques they used with Robert, saying that from the start, he was their only viable suspect. Now 52 years old, Cindy's son John wants people to remember his mother for her life, not her death. He would tell reporters in April of 2022 that she was a wonderful, wonderful person and I only miss her on days that end in the letter. In 1985, 17-year-old Michelle Avila, who just went by the nickname Missy, was a high school junior living in the working class town of Arleta, California, which is located just north of Los Angeles, California. Despite Missy being very physically small, she was under 5 feet tall and barely weighed 95 pounds, she had a big presence about her, and it made her very popular at her school. Not only was she incredibly beautiful, with boys and girls falling over themselves to try to win her affection, but also Missy was just very kind and gentle and didn't seem to take herself very seriously. But life for Missy was not all perfect. A year earlier, during her sophomore year, a nasty rumor had been spread around Missy's high school that Missy had apparently been sleeping with all of these boys who were in established relationships with girls in the school, and even though this rumor was a total lie, by the time the rumor reached the girlfriends of these boys that Missy had apparently slept with, these girls believed it. And so to get their revenge on Missy, one day after school when she had walked outside, this group of girls ganged up on her and beat her really, really badly. In fact, the beating was so severe that when Missy came home, her family immediately pressed charges on the girl that seemed to kind of lead the attack. Her name was Sonia Bon. But despite Missy and her family immediately filing these charges, the case dragged for months and months and months. But finally, by October 1st, 1985, so at the beginning of Missy's junior year, Missy was within a week of actually going to court and taking the stand and testifying against Sonia. And while Missy was certainly nervous about going to court and testifying, she knew deep down she was making the right decision. 
On October 1st, so a week before Missy is set to testify, Missy came home from school and she told her mom that she had plans that afternoon to go hang out with her friends. This was fairly routine for Missy, who had a big circle of friends, and so her mother, Irene, told her that was totally fine, but you gotta be home by 6 p.m. Missy agreed, and then just a couple of minutes later, a 17-year-old girl named Laura Doyle, who was very close with Missy, she pulled up outside of Missy's house and she honked the horn. And so Missy heard her, she said goodbye to her mom and to her brother, and then she left the house, ran to Laura's car, hopped inside, and the two girls drove off. A few hours later, at 6 p.m., Missy had still not come home yet. However, her mother, Irene, was not that surprised. Missy was not really a troublemaker, but she really liked staying out with her friends, and so it wasn't that uncommon for her to stay out past curfew and then come home and ask for forgiveness, or she would stay out past curfew and then she would call her mother and ask for more time. And shortly after 6 p.m., the phone rang inside of Missy's house. And so Irene, she hears the phone ringing, and she's expecting it to be her daughter. And so she walks over, she picks the phone up and says, hello, but it's not her daughter. It's another young girl's voice. It's Laura's voice, the girl who had picked Missy up after school to go hang out with friends. And before Irene could ask Laura why she was calling, Laura kind of awkwardly asked Irene, hey, is Missy home? And Irene would say, Laura, she left with you. Isn't she with you? No, she's not here. She's running late. Why? What's going on? After Irene said this, Laura began to panic. And then she proceeded to tell Irene what happened that afternoon while she was out with her daughter. She said after she picked Missy up, the two of them just kind of drove around town, which they did all the time. And then at some point, they made their way over to Stonehurst Park, where Missy and Laura and a bunch of their friends would often go and hang out. And so they drove over to Stonehurst, they made their way into the parking lot, and as soon as they were in there, Laura began looking around for other cars that she recognized to see if maybe their friends were there. But after looking around, she didn't recognize any of the cars, and so Laura just reflexively began turning the car around to leave the park. But as she was doing that, Missy stopped her and said, wait a minute, I know the guys over there, I want to go say hi. And so Laura stopped the car, and she looked in the direction that Missy was pointing, and on the far side of the parking lot were these two guys who appeared to be maybe in their late teens, early 20s. Laura did not recognize either of them, and they were standing outside of this blue car, a blue Camaro. Now, Laura was accustomed to Missy just kind of knowing everybody in town, because everybody loved Missy, and Missy loved everyone. And so this type of situation was not totally uncommon. However, Laura was just not very excited at the prospect of going and hanging out with these two total strangers to her. But she could tell Missy really wanted to. And so she turns to Missy and says, okay, you know, go out there, go say hi to them, and I'm going to park and I'll meet you in a second. And so Missy, she hops out of the car and she begins walking over to these two guys and she's waving to them and they're waving back and smiling at her. And Laura, meanwhile, pulls the car into a parking spot. She throws it in park and she's about to get out when she notices her gas gauge is below empty. And so she calls out to Missy, who's now halfway to these two guys. And she says, hey, I'm going to go fill my car up with gas and then I'll come back and I'll meet you. And so Missy turns around and she's like, okay, bye. And so Laura puts her car back in drive and she pulls out of the lot and she heads into town to get some gas. A few minutes later, when Laura pulled back into the Stonehurst parking lot, she looked in the direction of where the blue Camaro and the two guys were and where Missy was headed and they're all gone. Missy is nowhere to be seen. Now, this was 1985, so Laura could not just call or text Missy to see where she had gone. And so instead, Laura just sat in the parking lot looking at the vacant spot where the blue car had been, kind of going over in her mind what she should do. And eventually, she told herself that, you know what, Missy was a big girl, she can handle herself, she knew those guys, I'm sure everything is just fine, and those guys will drop her off at her house when she needs to go home. And so even though Laura is telling herself this, she would leave the Stonehurst parking lot and spend a while just kind of driving around town looking for Missy and looking for this blue Camaro and these two guys. And after finding none of them, she would head home. And then right after 6 p.m., Laura picked up the phone and she called Missy's house because she knew Missy's curfew was 6 p.m. And so she should be home by now. But of course, when Missy's mother, Irene, picked up the phone, Laura would learn Missy had not come home. 
And so Irene and Laura are immediately really worried about Missy, but not to the point where either of them think they should involve the police. Instead, Laura and Irene would spend the next couple of hours after that 6 p.m. phone call calling everybody they could think of that might know where Missy was. And when that yielded no results, Laura and Irene actually met up that night and began going door to door to all of Missy's friends and acquaintances' houses, asking the occupants if they knew where Missy was. But by late that night, no one had given them any information about Missy's whereabouts, and so still feeling very concerned about Missy, Laura and Irene decided the best thing to do was just to go back home and go to bed and hope in the morning Missy turned up or someone contacted them with information about where Missy was. But the following morning, Missy had still not turned up and no one had heard from her, and so that morning, Irene went to the police and told them what was going on. Immediately, the police honed in on Laura and began going over every single detail of what that blue Camaro was doing, what those two guys looked like, you know, what did Missy say about these two guys? Did she give any information about where they might go or who these guys were? And Laura, I mean, she was totally guilt-ridden and emotional about being the last person to see Missy before she has apparently vanished. And she sat there trying to give every bit of information she possibly could about what had happened that day. But unfortunately, she was just too far away from these two guys and their vehicle. She could only give them a sort of basic physical description, which Laura even admitted was not very accurate because it was really far away. And frankly, she wasn't looking that hard. And so after getting all the information they possibly could from both Laura and Irene, the police launched a very extensive search all over Arlita, California and the surrounding areas. And while they were doing that, Irene and other members of Missy's family, along with Laura and other close friends of Missy's, began their own search. But after a couple of days, neither the professional search nor the amateur search had turned up any new information about Missy's whereabouts or the whereabouts of those two guys and their blue Camaro. But then on October 4th, just three days after Missy went missing, Missy would be found. However, it would take investigators another three years to finally make sense of what actually happened to her. Based on eyewitness testimony, here is a recreation of what happened to Missy on the day she vanished. On that day, which was Tuesday, October 1st, 1985, Missy came back from school. She told her mother she wanted to go out and hang out with her friends. Her mother told her, okay, be home by six. And then a couple of minutes later, Laura pulled up outside and honked the horn and Missy ran outside, hopped in the car and they drove off. The pair would drive around town for a few minutes before making their way to Stonehurst Park. Now, to understand what happens next, you need some context. Missy had two best friends. One of them was 17-year-old Laura Doyle, who she was with, and the other was another 17-year-old girl named Karen Severson. These three girls had met when they were in grade school, they lived basically on the same street, and they spent virtually every second of every day together. However, a month earlier in September, the trio had had a falling out. Because a month earlier, another rumor about Missy sleeping with boys who had girlfriends began circulating around the school, except this time, the girlfriends in the rumor were Laura and Karen. Now, of course, Laura and Karen were well aware of the fact that a year earlier, Missy had been accused of something similar and it had all been a big lie. And so going into this new rumor, Laura and Karen knew that the likelihood of it being real was very slim. But because this rumor directly involved them and their boyfriends, they felt a little concerned. And so Laura and Karen went to Missy and they said, hey, we don't think it's true, but is it true? Did you sleep with our boyfriends? And Missy immediately is like, are you kidding me? No, I didn't sleep with your boyfriends. Did you see what happened last year? It's the same thing. It's a lie. It's just a rumor. I can't believe you would think I would do that to you. And so pretty quickly, this discussion escalated to a full-blown fight between the girls. Or more specifically, it turned into a full-blown fight between Karen and Missy. Because Laura, she was worked up about it, but pretty quickly she was able to calm down. But Karen, she didn't calm down. Because apparently, Karen had seen Missy at some point flirting with her boyfriend, and so when this rumor began to circulate, Karen felt like, you know what, it could be true. She might have had sex with my boyfriend. And so eventually, the three girls just stopped fighting. 
not because they had reached some sort of compromise, but rather because Missy just tried to turn around and walk away. And when she did, Karen wound up and slapped her across the face. And as soon as that happened, all three girls knew a line had been crossed and now their decade-long friendship was potentially ruined. Over the next couple of weeks, Missy and Laura were able to come together and patch things up, but Missy and Karen continued to avoid each other. However, the distance between them really wore on both of them, and so finally, on the morning of October 1st, Karen would reach out to Missy and she would apologize. And Missy was really touched by this, and before long, Missy and Karen and Laura had made plans for that afternoon to meet up at Stonehurst Park to have a good day together, just like old times. So that afternoon, Laura picks up Missy from her house, and the two of them drive around for a bit before heading over to Stonehurst Park, where they're planning to meet Karen. But when Laura pulls the car into the parking lot, they look around and Karen is not there. And the blue Camaro and those two guys standing around it on the far side of the parking lot, they weren't there either because Laura had made up the blue Camaro and those two guys. They never existed. That was all just a big cover up for what happens next. So Laura and Missy, they pull into the parking lot at Stonehurst and they park in a spot and proceed to wait for Karen. And Karen would show up just a couple of minutes later. But when she showed up, all hell broke loose. Karen came flying into the parking lot and came to a screeching stop right up alongside Laura's car. Karen had parked her car so close to Laura's car that Laura literally couldn't open her door without striking Karen's car. And in Karen's car, in the passenger seat, which was closest to Laura's car, was a terrified-looking 17-year-old named Eva Cherambolo, who was friends with all three of the girls. And that day, Karen had apparently asked Eva to come over for dinner. But after picking Eva up, without giving her any explanation, she had flown over to Stonehurst and then came to this screeching stop right next to Laura's car. And so Eva is sitting in the passenger seat looking at Karen and looking over at Laura and Missy having no idea what's going on. And Karen begins yelling at Eva to roll her window down. And so Eva rolls her window down and Laura and Missy are looking over in absolute astonishment. And then once the window is down on Eva's side, Karen begins screaming across Eva out the window at the car that Laura and Missy are in. And so Laura and Missy exchange totally confused looks, and then Laura rolls her window down, and suddenly Laura and Missy can hear what Karen is yelling. And Karen is hurling the most vile and horrible insults at Laura, not at Missy. It takes Laura a second to realize what Karen is yelling about, but once she realizes that Karen is just ruthlessly insulting her, Laura just turns and begins hurling insults back at Karen. And so the whole time Laura and Karen are just screaming at each other, Missy and Eva are just sitting in their respective passenger seats having no clue what's going on. And just as quickly as Karen had arrived and begun screaming at Laura, Karen put her car back in drive and sped right out of the parking lot. And Laura, at this point, is totally incensed and enraged at Karen for some of the things she had said. And so Laura fired up her car, threw it in drive, and before Missy could tell her otherwise, Laura had sped out of the parking lot after Karen. And for the next 45 minutes, Karen and Laura drove like absolute maniacs north of the city up into the mountains, where the whole time they're driving, Karen is swerving side to side, and she's speeding along these desolate roads, and Laura would speed up and get right on her bumper, like she was experiencing this extreme case of road rage. Now, for the first few minutes of this, both Missy and Eva were desperately trying to get their drivers to calm down and just pull over whatever you're fighting about. It's not worth crashing and dying over. But little did Missy or Ava know, there was something much, much bigger going on between Laura and Karen. And so their requests to stop the cars fell on deaf ears. Finally, after this 45-minute white-knuckle insane drive along these mountain roads came to an end when the road they were on kind of funneled them into this dirt parking lot in the middle of this huge forest. 
And as soon as they reached this parking lot, Karen came to a stop and Laura narrowly avoided smashing into her and came to a stop right next to her. And as soon as the two cars were stopped, both drivers hopped out and were immediately in each other's faces, shoving each other, screaming at each other, just continuing this awful fight. Eva just stayed in the passenger seat and did nothing. She was just hoping that whatever was going on would eventually end and they could leave. But Missy, she's looking out there at her two best friends who seem like they're about to kill each other. And so Missy decides she's going to get out and try to separate them. And so she begins to open her car door, and the second she does, both Karen and Laura, who are maybe five or six feet away from her car door, they both immediately stop fighting. It was like a switch had been thrown, and whatever was going on had come to a complete and total stop. And at the same time they have suddenly stopped fighting, both girls simultaneously turn and look at Missy. And before Missy could say or do anything, Karen and Laura ran over and positioned themselves right outside of Missy's door. So Missy could no longer shut the door and Missy could not get out of the car. She was totally trapped. And as soon as Karen was in position right outside of the car, Karen kind of got down and got right in Missy's face. And with a very menacing and hissing voice, she looks at Missy and says, you know, this whole thing was a joke. Me and Laura, we weren't actually fighting. We're not mad at each other but we are mad at someone, we're mad at you. And then Karen and Laura would reach down and pull Missy out of the car and they would slam her back up against the side of Laura's car. And then Laura and Karen pressed up against her and began screaming at Missy that she had slept with their boyfriends and they knew it. And this whole time, Missy is trying to tell them, no, I didn't, I did not sleep with your boyfriends. I don't know what's going on. But at some point, Karen and Laura were screaming so loudly and they were right on top of her that Missy just kind of began to shut down and she went quiet and kind of tucked herself into a ball. And as soon as this happened, Karen and Laura, they grabbed Missy and they began pushing her away from the car towards a trail that led into the forest. And Missy, she's four foot 10, 95 pounds, she's tiny. And Karen was five foot two, over 200 pounds. And Laura was five foot six inches tall and weighed 135 pounds. And so Missy knew she could not put up a fight. She had no chance against these two. And so Missy just kind of began shuffling her feet, walking towards this trail. And periodically, Karen and Laura would walk up and push her to walk towards this trail. And as this is happening, Eva, who had been sitting in the car the whole time, she finally got out and kind of walked up behind the group, but didn't participate. She just walked along behind them. And so after a couple of minutes, Karen and Laura had managed to push Missy all the way to the actual start of the trail, this narrow trail that left the parking lot. And at that point, Laura walked around Missy, so she was in front of her, and Karen stayed behind Missy. And the two girls ordered Missy to keep following them into the woods. And Missy did not put up a fight. She just put her head down and continued walking along the trail behind Laura with Karen behind her periodically pushing her. And then several steps behind Karen was Eva who just continued to do nothing. After the girls had walked for a little while on this trail and were out of sight of the parking lot, Laura came to an abrupt stop and she turned around to face Missy. And by this point, Missy was genuinely terrified. She was crying, she had her head down and she was just hoping that her captors were going to let her go. But once they stopped and Missy looked up at Laura, Laura wound up and decked Missy right in the face. And as soon as she hit Missy, Karen immediately jumped in. And before long, Missy was on the ground getting punched and kicked and stomped on by Laura and Karen. And again, Eva just stood there watching, doing nothing. Eventually, Laura and Karen would stop beating Missy. And at that point, Laura would pull out a knife and she would reach down and she would grab Missy's hair and she began hacking it off. Missy was not a vain person, but she loved her hair. It had to be perfect anywhere she went. It was her prized possession and Laura and Karen knew it. And so Laura, she begins hacking off the hair with her knife and Karen, who wanted to get involved but didn't have a knife, just began grabbing Missy's hair and ripping it out with her fists. Finally, after much of Missy's hair had been hacked off of her head, Laura and Karen stopped and just stood up and looked down at Missy, who was now in the fetal position just crying to herself. But Laura and Karen were not done. At this point, they got out restraints and they tied Missy's hands behind her back and they gagged her mouth. And again, Eva did nothing. Once Missy was completely restrained, Laura got up and began walking towards a nearby stream that was about 10 feet away from them down a hill. 
And so Laura gets down to the stream. She wades in about halfway where the water comes up about eight inches on her leg. And then she turns around and she looks up the hill at Missy and Karen and Eva, who's off to the side. And Laura, while staring directly at Missy, she reaches down and begins running her fingers through the water and says to Missy, why don't you come down and get in the water with me? When Missy didn't move, Karen, who was standing next to her, hauled her up and then pushed her down the hill. And Missy doesn't have the ability to brace her fall because her hands are bound. And so she slams down on her face and she rolls down to the edge of the water and there she stops. And before Missy can get up, Karen and Laura had descended on her. They'd grabbed her by the shoulders and they began dragging her out into the water. And so Eva, who's watching this happen, again does nothing and just turns around and begins running down the trail back towards the cars. When she gets to the cars, she discovers they are both locked, so she can't go anywhere, and she was too far away from anywhere to walk, and so her only choice was just to go back down the trail to where her friends were. And so Eva goes back to this trail, and she begins walking in the direction of the stream, and as she's walking, before she can see any of the girls, she hears a terrifying, blood-curdling scream coming from somewhere deep in the forest. And Eva was so terrified that she stopped where she was, she turned around, and she ran back to the cars. Eva would sit down on the ground between the two cars, and she would begin to rock back and forth. After nearly an hour of doing that, Karen and Laura suddenly emerged from the trailhead, soaking wet and laughing. Missy was not with them. After Ava had turned around and run away from the stream to go back to the cars the first time, Laura and Karen had grabbed Missy, dragged her into the water, and laid her on her stomach in the eight inches of water. And so Missy is trying desperately to keep her head out of the water, but Laura comes around and grabs her legs and presses them into the water, and then Karen comes around and grabs the back of Missy's head and forces her head down into the water. Missy would start fighting for her life, trying to wriggle her way out of the water, and at some point she would manage to get out from under their grasp, and as soon as her head cleared the water, she took in a big breath and then let out that piercing, horrifying scream that Ava heard as she was walking back down the trail, which scared her and caused her to run away again. And after Missy let out that primal scream, Karen readjusted her grip and pressed her head back into the water. Missy would continue to squirm and fight against Karen and Laura, and periodically she'd get her head up out of the water just enough to get a little gulp of air, and then she'd choke down a bunch of water and have her head pushed down into the water again. Until finally, Missy's strength just started to ebb. And when Karen and Laura sensed that Missy was on the verge of death and she was very weak, they seized the opportunity and they leapt off of her just long enough to run over to the side of the stream where there was this big, heavy log, which investigators would later determine weighed over a hundred pounds. So it weighed more than Missy. And Karen and Laura, they'd pick this log up, they'd walk back into the stream, and they'd drop the log directly on the back of Missy's head, forcing it down into the water permanently. A few minutes after drowning Missy in the stream, Karen and Laura walked out of the trail, they got into their cars, Eva climbed into Laura's car, and the girls just left the parking lot and drove back home, leaving Missy in the woods. Three days later, a group of hikers were in that forest near where Missy had been killed, and they spotted her body in the stream. When police arrived, they found cigarette butts, a beer bottle, and men's overalls lying out near where Missy was found. These items were there entirely coincidentally. They had nothing to do with what happened to Missy, but they somehow made the lie about Missy being with those two guys in their Camaro before she vanished seem more believable. Mostly because when Laura described these two guys to police, she kind of made it seem like they were bad boys or troublemakers, like the type of guys who would go off into the woods and smoke and drink for fun. And so the police just continued to chase down this two guys and a blue Camaro lead until the murder case went cold. But three years after Missy was murdered, Eva, who had been threatened by Karen and Laura never to say a word about what she knew, finally came forward to police and told them that Karen and Laura had killed Missy. 
When Karen, Laura, and Missy became teenagers, Missy really blossomed into this beautiful young woman who everybody seemed to adore. Meanwhile, Laura and Karen had the opposite experience. They felt awkward in their bodies and felt like no one really liked them. And so in time, they became very jealous of Missy, and that jealousy turned into resentment, and that resentment turned into hatred. And so, in 1984, it was Karen and Laura who started that rumor about Missy sleeping with all these boys who had girlfriends. And that lie would get Missy attacked and beat up really badly. But that wasn't enough for Karen and Laura. They felt like Missy deserved worse. And so the following year, in September of 1985, Laura and Karen decided to kill Missy. Their plan began with spreading another rumor about Missy, about how she was sleeping around with boys with girlfriends, except this time the girlfriends in this rumor would be Laura and Karen. They did this knowing this rumor would start a fight between the three of them, and they knew that Missy just would not be able to be mad at her friends. She would want to make up with them. And so Karen and Laura, they start this rumor. It does cause a big blowout fight between the three of them. But then after this fight, Laura very intentionally makes up with Missy and kind of says, hey, you know, let's make things right again. And so she pretends to be friends with Missy. And then a couple of weeks later, on the morning of October 1st, Karen would contact Missy. She would tell her how sorry she was. And she asked her, hey, do you want to get together today, all three of us, just like old times? And Missy fell right into their trap because she was so excited at the prospect of getting to spend time with her two best friends who she really did love. And so she quickly agreed to meet up with them. And so Laura and Missy, they arrive in the parking lot of Stonehurst Park, and then Karen comes flying in, and there's this huge fight, and there's this 45-minute drive up into the mountains where they reach this parking lot, and Karen and Laura are fighting with each other, and Missy has no idea what's going on, and then all of a sudden, the fighting stops. Because the fighting wasn't real. It was all rehearsed. Laura and Karen had done that in order to throw Missy off guard and to get her up into this forest up in the mountains where they could kill her. It's unclear why Laura and Karen brought Eva along, but most likely she was brought along as a decoy as well. After Missy's body was found and the police were on this mad hunt to find these two guys and the blue Camaro, Karen actually moved in to Missy's family's home. She told them she just wanted to offer support during this really difficult time, but in reality, she just wanted to keep close tabs on the investigation, and any chance she got, she wanted to make sure she threw police and Missy's family off of her and Laura's trail. And so for months, Karen slept in Missy's bed, she ate at the same dinner table where Missy would eat with Missy's family, and Karen would spend hours out in the car with Missy's mother, Irene, and other members of Missy's family driving around looking for clues about where Missy could have gone or who really was responsible for Missy's death. When the truth finally came out three years later that Karen and Laura had been the ones who killed Missy, Missy's family could not believe that their daughter's killer was literally living with them the whole time. Ultimately, Laura and Karen would be found guilty of killing Missy, and they would each be sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. Karen Severson was paroled in December of 2011, and Laura Doyle was paroled a year later in December of 2012. 
Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, the next time the Amazon Music follow button is having a bad day, offer to make them a cup of tea. But make sure you add the milk before the water and use Splenda instead of sugar. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our main YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. We have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that honors and supports victims of violent crime as well as their families. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. Go to mrballin.foundation and click Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. If you want to check out our merch, join our Discord server, or just see what's going on at Ballin Studios, head on over to our brand new website, ballinstudios.com. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.